So Elizabeth J. Thank you. So, rape is bad. I am going to get into more controversial territory in a moment, don't worry. I just thought I'd start off with something a little bit more agreeable, right? You all know you're on the same page when somebody opens with rape is bad. Maybe the most agreeable statement on earth. Everybody in here agrees with that statement. If there's anybody here who doesn't agree, raise your hand and I'll direct you to... We have security here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. We all hate rapists. We all hate rape. We publish their names and faces in the media, uh, and we put them on a special list to make sure nobody has to run into them by accident. We don't even do that with murderers in a lot of places, right? Maybe we should. But for real this time, could I get a show of hands? Anybody who's heard of either Malik Richmond or the Steubenville football team? Maybe you've heard of the Steubenville rape case. A couple of you? Okay. Who's heard of Brock Turner? A few more people. That's what I thought. So these are American criminals, one-time criminals as far as I know. They're American criminals who weren't especially known for anything before they were tried. And you guys, some of you know their names all the way in Ottawa. Why is that? It's because we as a society have decided that it is appropriate, and I happen to agree, that somebody should be internationally hated for sexually assaulting women, right? These people are internationally hated. And I think it's probably not a terrible thing that if somebody does something as terrible, the likes of Malik Richmond or Brock Turner, that we have given them sort of at least temporarily life-ruining consequences for their actions that extend all the way to a place like this. Uh, for those of you, oh, by the way, I do want to apologize up front before I move on. Uh, I'm sorry, I am American, which is a sentence that I find myself saying more and more often as time goes on. Uh, but because I'm American, most of the cultural references, statistics, research, and so on that I'm most familiar with comes from my own country. Uh, I think I've done my due diligence to make sure that everything that I talk about applies to is applicable to Canadians as well. But if I missed anything, please let me know, and I'll just go ahead and draw from different examples, connect those dots, do whatever it is I need to do. But for those of you that don't know, Malik Richmond was a high school football star in a small town called Steubenville. And back in 2012, he, along with some of his teammates, raped a drunk, unconscious girl at a party. Uh, it was especially horrific that some of his superiors, some of the district staff, knew about the incident but didn't talk about it. Some of them even tried to cover it up, which is really shocking given that somebody actually filmed the assault. So naturally, because these boys felt entitled to do whatever they wanted to a drunk person's, an unconscious person's body, and their superiors try to protect them from the consequences of their actions, this story is normally held up as the quintessential example of rape culture, right? And it's not a crazy thought. Obviously, there was something wrong with the culture of that town that led to this many people interacting in this way. However, the existence of a crime alone is not evidence that the community or that the culture condones it. Quite the contrary, the community and the culture from coast to coast uh, expressed unanimously that this is not remotely acceptable behavior, this is not okay by any stretch of the imagination. There was coast to coast outrage, everybody was disgusted, uh, people who were involved were tried, jailed, and that failing forced to resign in this society where it's supposedly so acceptable to sexually assault women Rapists were tried and convicted along with those who enabled them. And uh, everybody's reputation was smeared across the country in a sensational news story among echoing cries for castration and death. Right? Not remotely socially acceptable. And thank goodness. Can you imagine a culture that was okay with that? Rock Turner, on the other hand. Uh, slightly similar story. He was a student at Stanford University. This was 2015. Uh, and he similarly raped a drunk unconscious woman at a party. Uh, the outrage associated with his story is partially the crime itself, which is horrific, and partially about the sentence. Rob Turner got off pretty easy. He only was sentenced to about six months in prison. I think he only served about two of them. Uh, so naturally, again, he's kind of become the poster boy for rape culture. He did something horrible, and he got 
not completely away with it, but he got off easy. Uh, and it's widely assumed that a big part of why he got off easy was because he was a man, and society doesn't care enough when men do terrible things to women. And fair play, maybe we should be working harder, maybe we should try harder, but for point of comparison, I'd like to sort of unpack these assumptions with a quick thought experiment, right? I want you to imagine what might have happened, how things would have proceeded had Brock Turner been a woman and the victim of this story a man. So imagine exactly the same crime, but reverse the genders. Who believes that the female version of Brock Turner would have been treated more harshly by the criminal justice system? <laughs> what about more leniently? Yeah, some of you see where this is going. As it turns out, this thought experiment has already somewhat played out in the real world. Uh, about a year before the events of Turner's case, an American actress and comedian delivered a speech at an event called the Gloria Awards and Gala. And this was an event to sort of honor visionary women. And she delivered a speech that was meant to be a story of her own personal empowerment coming into her own as a young woman, getting comfortable in her own skin, that sort of thing. And she began the story by describing a young man that she had known at the university, whom she was desperately crushing on. And like all of us have experienced at some point or another, this person wanted nothing to do with her. He was not interested, he wouldn't give her the time of day, wouldn't even really want to talk to her. Uh, until one day, he contacts her when he is blackout drunk. And she's sober, and she goes to see him. Uh, and she goes out of her way in her speech to describe the condition this young man was in as so drunk that he was not himself. So drunk that he couldn't focus his vision, his speech was slurred, his volume was too loud, and he was in and out of consciousness. In the parlance of our times, we call this condition too drunk to consent, right? Uh, and of course, uh, the, as the story goes on, she describes the uh, sex that she proceeds to have with him in spite of this. And I want to be clear, this was not an apology or a confession. This was a, a speech meant to empower and inspire women and girls. It was a brag in front of a nationally broadcast cameras about how she used a physically and mentally incapacitated person to regain her confidence in her body and her sexuality. Uh, and it was unapologetic. The line that immediately comes to mind from, from this speech, uh, when I think about it, goes something like, is it really considered getting head if the guy falls asleep every three seconds? This was a nationally broadcast speech meant to empower women and girls. Uh, big yikes. Uh, this person, by the way, is Amy Schumer. Good part of her. And the event, again, was called the Gloria Awards and Gala. You can Google the transcript for all the gory details. If you really want to know, it's available in a lot of places. But let's start, sort of talk about the reception of this story. Because remember, we talked about how Brock Turner's rape was received. We talked about how Malik Richmond was received. And, and this time, with, with Schumer, there were no torches or pitchforks. There was no public outcry. There was no court case. No judge held accountable to deserve a proper and deliver a proper and deserved sentence, none of that. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary, there was applause. I mean, social media was ablaze with an outpouring of love and appreciation for this woman. Uh, the news media published article after article. We're talking Huffington Post, Washington Post, Gawker, Bustle, Vulture, on and on and on. By the way, that's why you can Google the transcript, calling her courageous, empowering, calling her a feminist role model. That one's always alarming. Amy Schumer, if her story is to be believed, committed exactly the same type of crime that earned the likes of Brock Turner and Malik Richmond international vitriolic outrage. And instead, she is met with congratulations. Meanwhile, anybody who objects to what she did is written off by activists and editorialists alike and anybody who
anybody who reads these articles will find that the editorialists blame Schumer's victim for the discomfort and dissatisfaction she felt with the sex that she forced on him. He's painted as the predatory one for daring to be drunk and unconscious when she was there and attracted to him. Folks, uh, this is what a rape culture looks like. And I want to take a moment to pause because I really want to talk about what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that women who are victimized have it easy. We don't. We absolutely don't. And I'm not saying that women never face cultural problems, bureaucratic problems, or that we're never failed by the criminal justice system. Because that would be an outrageous claim. I'm not making it. I'm not making those claims. But here's one thing that women do have. We have empathy. We are acknowledged. There are systems in place, programs, and institutions to protect us from assault, to help us find justice, and to support us. Male victims have none of those things. And when it comes to the task of trying to heal from an act like these, that makes all the difference in the world. So here's something that I want you to think about as we proceed. Which gender's rapists are most often condoned, excused, or swept under the rug? Who is most often told that they're asking for it or blamed for the victimization? And who is most often disbelieved or mistreated when they try to report? If there were a news story to be held up as an example of rape culture, it would be of this speech in which a woman brags unabashedly in front of cameras about raping a young man in which anybody who objects or disagrees or has questions is written off as hyperbolic or confused and in which the international conversation about sexual violence continues to exclude female perpetrators and male victims because they are genuinely believed to either not exist or not merit discussion. Again, this is what a rape culture looks like. And this attitude is not limited to the fan base of one American comedian. It's very pervasive. Uh, when you do what I do, when you talk about this stuff everywhere you go, survivors start to come out of the woodwork with their stories. Uh, and I know men who've been assaulted by other men, men who've been assaulted by women, women who've been assaulted by other women. And the stories are always the same. They always report the same problems, which are disbelief or ridicule from friends and family, a complete lack of support, either culturally or institutionally, and unmotivated, incredulous police officers. I have close, personal friends who will tell you that when they tried to report, the cop they went to laughed in their faces, literally laughed in their faces. I have friends who were victimized by somebody they knew who turned around and falsely accused them to preempt any help seeking. Imagine having to face violence at the hands of somebody you know, and then have to face your community or a jury of your peers and explain to them that the person accusing you is your rapist and not the other way around. And as it turns out, the data backs up a lot of these anecdotes. There was a 2011 article in the Journal of Family Violence that reported on and analyzed the experiences of men who sought help after being victimized by intimate partner violence, which includes sexual violence. Uh, and more recent research has, has shown that the majority of men who are victimized are targeted by partners or ex-partners, so this is actually pretty representative. Uh, but what they found was that men are routinely dismissed, ridiculed, or disbelieved by helpline professionals or referred to programs for abusers rather than programs for the abused. And that when men try to report their crimes to criminal justice entities, 
Sometimes they are disbelieved as my friends, and sometimes they're arrested on the assumption that they're the predatory ones. Because we assume that all sexual violence is committed by men and suffered by women. These, these are the assumptions. And this is what a rape culture looks like. So, again, I do want to make sure that I'm understood. I'm not saying that we need to abandon our campaigns to stop male perpetrated assault or defend their victims who are often female. These campaigns are very important, but they are too narrow. We need to broaden the conversation to make sure that we include everybody who's currently left out by a one-sided narrative that sometimes even deliberately excludes both same-sex assault and female assault of men. Because the fact of the matter is, sexual violence is not a gendered phenomenon. According to consistent annual data from the Center for Disease Control in the US, every year, men and women report similar rates, about the same one to 2% rate of victimization by forced sex, mostly by the opposite gender. And this is about 1.1% for each. We're looking at 2010. In 2011, we saw 1.6% for women reported victimization, 1.7% of men. And in 2012, we saw a percent for women and almost double 1.7% of men. And again, I'll remind you, this is not some fringe organization with a, a political men's agenda. This is the Center for Disease Control. It's the leading uh, research health organization in the United States whose influence is both quite representative of global attitudes and also reaches out to influence other societies to some extent. This is huge. It should turn the tables on everything we're doing to try to address sexual violence, from education to research to victim services to criminal justice. We should make massive updates to all of these fields to accommodate this new information, but it never really sees the light of day. Even men's activists don't always know about this. Why is that? There are a lot of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, the way the CDC and many, many, many other organizations classify sexual violence does a massive disservice to male victims. So for example, when a man assaults a woman and forces her to have sex, we call it quite justifiably, quite reasonably, reasonably we call that rape, because it is. But when exactly the same crime happens in the other direction, which is to say a woman forces herself on a man, we call that made to penetrate. And it's obfuscated away, hidden into a separate box, never to be seen again. It doesn't make it to the headlines, it doesn't make it to the education, and it doesn't make it to the institutions that actually would make use of this information to help people. And the thing is, the CDC is very thorough in the way that it defines its terms. There are several categories, so to speak, of sexual assault, of sexual violence that they study, and their definitions are paragraphs. So they went out of their way to place rape and made to penetrate into two different categories. There is a prominent researcher in the organization who goes by the name of Mary P. Koss, uh, and she has spoken a lot on this topic, sort of defending this separate categorization. Uh, I reference her, again, because her attitudes are incredibly representative of what you see around the world when addressing these two different, when reconciling the difference between men's and women's victimization. And here's what she has to say on the subject. 
This is probably the most famous quote by her on the topic, and probably also the most egregious. But what she has to say is, we acknowledge the inappropriateness of female verbal coercion and the legitimacy of male perceptions that they've had on wanted sex. Although men may sexually penetrate women when ambivalent about their own desires, these acts fail to meet legal definitions of rape that are based on the penetration of the body of the victim. Yikes, right? So, Koss is right about one thing. In the US, as well as the UK, as well as parts of many other American countries, as well as parts of Australia, and many, many, many other places in the world, these two phenomena are separated legally. Where rape is penetration of the body of the victim, and made to penetrate is part of the broader sexual assault category, which usually gets lesser sentences and is considered a lesser crime. As I understand it, in Canada, your laws are a little bit broader. Uh, you have just a sexual assault category that includes both of these. Uh, so hopefully your male survivors have a better shot at justice than in some other places. So that's an open question. However, the phrasing of Koss's argument very clearly reflects prominent misconceptions about both sexuality and male victimization. And I'll flip back to that quote for you. Uh, rape of women being universally condemned, rape of men is inappropriate. You know, like wearing a short dress to church or swearing in front of children, inappropriate. Men are not actually violated by, by you know, men are not treated to a consent violation. Men are perceiving that they've had unwanted sex. Like, it's something you could be wrong about. Men aren't harmed by a violation of their right to bodily autonomy, according to this attitude. No. They are... Mm, ambivalent about their own desires. Uh, this definition includes male on male. Yes, it includes male on male. Okay. Yes, yes it does. Uh, but unfortunately it doesn't, it doesn't include a lot of other types of assault uh, that, that should be sort of elevated in a bigger deal. But the the issue here, and, and maybe it sounds like I'm splitting hairs. Should I plausibly address that? No, we're good. <laughs> okay. But the issue here is that uh, even though you can say that it doesn't matter what you call it as long as you condemn it, the headlines, the education, and all of this information hides most male victims away when they say things like one in five women and one in 71 men will be raped in their lifetime. Because those quotes, those statistics refer back to a specific kind of rape that is almost exclusively suffered by women. Not obviously like you pointed out, male on male is included in there, but most male victims uh, are excluded from that. So it looks like it's not a big deal but it's because they're focusing on a definition that excludes most men. You could just as easily exclude women's experiences by saying that only one in 166 women will be made to penetrate another person in her lifetime. Only one in 166, that's great news. So you can put down your signs and stop campaigning now. Not a big deal, right? That would be terrible. These campaigning or and, and, and categorizing and, and research strategies are unnecessarily gendered when what we should be doing is approaching the problem from a humanitarian perspective because sexual violence affects both many women and many men. Unfortunately, most people are resistant to the concept of female and male assault. 
And there are a lot of reasons for this that vary from the biological to the cultural to the institutional. Probably uh, one of the biggest problems is that we perceive male and female sexualities as being dramatically different from one another. And, and we can argue the extent to, you know, to which that may or may not be true, but when we, when we take it to hyperbolic extremes, we see men as giving blanket consent by virtue of being guys. Because we see something, uh, we see sex as something that is, that men pursue and, and women endure, right? You see that in like every old timey sitcom under the sun. We see it in expressions like she opened her legs for him or she let him have sex with her as if sex is something that women let men do rather than something that men and women do together, something that women can do to men, let alone same sex experiences. And so any contact that is unsolicited from a woman to a man is, is nevertheless perceived as welcome or appreciated. We condemn assault of women because we know that there are times when women don't want to have sex. But we see men as always on. We see them as wanting to have sex with every woman all the time. So we just, oh, but it's fine then. You can just do whatever you want because he'll appreciate it. As if he doesn't have a say in his own standards and boundaries for his own body. <clears throat> and yet we even see this mentality in sexual abuse cases in schools, right? When you have a male teacher who abuses female students, everybody acknowledges that that's horrible. But when you have the reverse, when you have a female teacher abusing the male students, what do you hear? Oh, what a lucky guy. Wish I had a teacher like that when I was a kid. As if any male, even a male child, is always, always, always consenting. As if it's okay for an adult to have sex with a child as long as it's the male sexuality, which is perceived as always on, being victimized by the female sexuality, which is perceived as, you know, careful and, and gatekeepery and all of that, right? So at this point, you're probably wondering about certain biological problems with this thesis, with this point. Uh, you're, you may be wondering, how does, how does a woman force herself on a man because wouldn't the biological functions not function, right? So uh, show of hands, gentlemen, if you would be so kind. Please raise your hand if you have never in your life had an erection for no good reason. I'll wait, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so... Uh, babies have erections. <laughs> sure, sure, I don't want to be discriminatory. <laughs> uh, so obviously, there's always a reason physiologically, right? Whether it's legitimately I'm attracted to this person and I want to do this, to a spike in blood pressure, to, you know, the way your pants are on, to the Having proverbial to stiff breeze. I'm sorry? Having to pee in the morning. Having to pee in the morning, yeah. Absolutely. To somebody touching the guy in a way that he associates with sexuality, whether or not he wants them to. Right? But because of this misconception, we think, oh, well, as long as his body indicates an interest, we just put, it, put our hands on him and it's fine. We can do whatever we want. Because that, that means it's okay. As if a penis were a switch, you can turn on and off at will. This is no different from she was wet, so she was asking for it. Obviously, obviously a person's physiological bodily response should never be taken as permission, especially, but not only, when somebody is actively telling you the opposite. After all, if I were walking down the street and you heard my stomach growl, you wouldn't turn around and shove a sandwich down my throat, would you? God, I hope not. You might have another biological concern. You might be wondering, how is it possible for a woman to overpower and assault a bigger, stronger man? And maybe you saw those statistics earlier and you went, there's no way. Absolutely not. There's no way the numbers would work out that way. The size and strength differentials would make it impossible. These are good questions. And here's what I've found. 
Men can and do wake up drunk at a party with an unwanted woman on top of him, just like the reverse. Men are no less incapacitated by drugs like Rohypnol, and women are no less capable of dropping them into a drink, sometimes with things like Viagra. And what women lack in physical strength, they make up for in a priori credibility and social acceptability. Remember Amy Schumer, right? The expression, do this or I'll tell everyone you raped me, is unlikely to be said by a male rapist. But it's very much a tool at the disposal of his female counterpart, who knows that she can use the assumption that sexual violence is a male-on-female crime to coerce her victim, brandishing not a fist, but the weight of her community and legal system. And say he tries to fight back. He's bigger. He can stop her, right? Maybe. Imagine what happens should he leave a bruise or a scratch on her in self-defense. Is she going to go tell all of her friends that jerk wouldn't let me rape, her? rape him? Probably not. How is she going to explain away those injuries? Whose side of the story is the community going to believe? What about the police if it gets that far, right? And given the standards of masculinity that men are held to, who's going to have sympathy for a man who is trying not to have sex? If he fights back, he's likely to be taken from the frying pan and tossed straight into the fire. So his size and strength advantages might not be much of an advantage to him at all. And many men will not fight back against any kind of female perpetrated abuse for this reason. So to summarize, these are the problems that men are facing. She believes it's okay to touch him or to force herself on him because nobody teaches women to respect consent the way we teach men to. Because we assume that men are always consenting. Any data to the contrary that would teach us otherwise is hidden away, obfuscated, and never paid attention to. Any data that you might see in justice statistics is going to exclude male victims, most male victims of rape, because it's not counted as rape because men don't report because every person they've ever talked to from their friends to the family to the very professionals whose job it is to help survivors have mistreated them when they tried and because many times officers won't even take a report from a male victim because most of the time People have no idea that a man can be a victim. Which is why it is so important to combat the misconception that sexual assault is a male on female crime. The more people we have on the ground level talking about this, the better chance we have of changing these institutions. Just as we're asked by progressive and feminist advocates to say something when we hear somebody say something we think might be misogynistic or might imply uh, a consent violation toward a woman, we need to step in and say, excuse me, when we hear sexual violence referred to as a one-way gendered street. Because until we can get this conversation started, it's going to be in the hands of the often well-meaning but horribly misguided activists who leave all this out. And once we get ourselves talking about both sides of the story and changing the conversation, we can start to shift the culture, we can start to shift the research, and we can get, we can put pressure on our institutions to change so that we can help everyone who's victimized and so that we can hold everyone who abuses accountable.